Let's pray. What a day that will be. When faith becomes sight, when all tears are wiped away, Lord, to know you, to see you face to face, to be without sin, to be without sorrow, when death itself will have died. Oh, Lord, we long for that day, and very soon we will have been there longer than we've been here. We recognize the fleeting nature of this life and the smallness of earthly time compared to eternity. We pray in these next few moments as we look to your word that you would recalibrate our hearts to think about your mission in this world, your purpose for the church, your purpose for each of our individual lives, and that we use them for your glory. All the stewardship of resources and time and relationships, God, we ask it for the sake of the name, the glory, the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that the Lamb would indeed receive the reward of his suffering, that people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people would surround the throne of the Lamb and give glory to you forever. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 15. We are nearing the finish line of this epic letter, the book of Romans. And this morning, we get a window into the ministry of the Apostle Paul, why he has written the letter, why he is aiming to go to Rome and beyond Rome. And this may give us a window into not only the purpose of the life of the Apostle Paul, but the purpose of the church in extension of Paul's ministry. Jesus had many disciples during his earthly ministry. He focused on 12 in particular, and one was a traitor. You subtract one from 12, you get 11. You add one more Matthias, and you get back to 12. But then you add one more apostle. These 12 disciples became apostles from a verb that means to send with a commission, a particular task, and with authority of the sender. These apostles, or sent and commissioned ones, were joined by an apostle called one untimely born. Paul the apostle was not one of the early disciples of Jesus. He was not a disciple or a follower of Jesus during Jesus' earthly ministry. He was, in fact, a persecutor of the followers of Jesus. He was an enemy of the gospel. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees and convinced of his own inherent righteousness before God until he met Christ personally on the road to Damascus. It was floored, overturned, overhauled, and made useful for Christ. He was an apostle after the others. He considered himself the least of all the apostles, and he was given a specific commission. We might affectionately call the apostle Paul our apostle, for most of us in this room. He was, of course, the apostle to the Gentiles. He is the one specifically given the task of taking the gospel beyond the reaches of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the synagogues of the dispersion to those where Messiah had never been named, to Gentiles beyond the reaches of Old Testament witness, to the Gentile world, farther out and less familiar with the promises of God. Acts 9.15 records this, Jesus said to Paul, go, or said to the associates who cared for Paul, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Paul said at the beginning of this letter of Romans that he received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. In Galatians 1.16, Paul reveals that God revealed his son in Paul so that Paul might preach Jesus among the Gentiles. 
And Paul was given the task by agreement of the other apostles to go to the Gentiles while Peter and the others went to the house of Israel, to the Jews. And Paul records in 1 Timothy 2, For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. He says, I am the least of the apostles, 1 Corinthians 15, not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Paul, as the apostle to the Gentiles, was given a specific commission, a specific t- task by Jesus to take the message of Israel's Messiah to the Gentile world. We get a window into this task in Romans 15, beginning in verse 15. The passage we're looking at this morning takes us through verse 21. Follow along as I read this passage. Paul says, I have written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest to the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed and the power of signs and wonders and the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And thus I aspire to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. Paul's commission from Christ as apostle to the Gentiles drove him to desire pioneering evangelism and church planting. That was his ministry. And we get a window into his mindset here in this morning's passage. We'll be looking at four characteristics of Paul's apostolic ministry to the Gentiles. By way of outline, four characteristics of Paul's apostolic ministry to the Gentiles. We're looking here this morning at something that was unique to Paul. Unique to Paul as an apostle. Unique to Paul as uniquely commissioned by Jesus Christ for a specific task. And the first characteristic of that apostolic ministry to Gentiles was that Paul viewed his ministry as undeserved privilege. He viewed this ministry as undeserved privilege. Notice what he says, beginning in the second half of verse 15, because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ to the Gentiles. By the grace given to me by God. Three different ways Paul says here in the beginning of this or in the middle of this verse, stacked up on top of each other to say this is an undeserved privilege. First of all, it is grace. That is undeserved favor. And here Paul does not mean the grace of salvation in Christ. He means the undeserved favor of being a minister to Gentiles. And if you know anything about Jew-Gentile relationships in the first century, this would be an odd statement. To go to the outsiders, those who were considered the dogs, not hardly worthy of the scraps from the table. And Paul here says, it is an inestimable privilege from God to be given this grace of ministry to the Gentiles. He says, it is grace given to me. It's kind of a duplicated way of saying he didn't deserve this, and it is given by God. What is this grace gift from the Lord? His commissioning to Gentiles. This was not Paul's brainchild. This was not Paul's innovation. Paul did not come up with this strategy. This was from God himself. And he uses here in verse 16 a metaphor of priestly service. Look at the verse. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. 
And he uses here words like minister and ministering as a priest and offering and acceptable and sanctified. This is all vocabulary from the sacrificial system, from temple worship and the offerings to God. And here Paul is stacking up these words as a metaphor for his own ministry. He calls himself a minister, that is one who performs public service. The word could be used of a government servant or a religious servant, but here in this context, it's clearly religious. It goes along with all of the temple and sacrificial vocabulary. And he is a minister of Messiah Jesus. The very one that he persecuted, the very one that came to him on the road to Damascus and saved him from his sins and then commissioned him. He is to be a minister of this Messiah, Jesus. And he is ministering as a priest. Quite literally, he is priesting the gospel of God. Serving as, a, as an intermediary, as a, an ambassador, a representative of God with the gospel. That is, with the good news of Jesus Christ's death in the place of sinners. And he here is presenting an offering. The offering is that which is presented as a sacrifice, a a voluntary gift given at cost to the giver. And this offering was to be acceptable to God, sanctified or set apart or made holy. And in this metaphor, Paul is like a priest conducting temple service, bringing sanctified offerings acceptable to God. And the offerings are people. They are the Gentiles. Those who believed the gospel from the nations and peoples outside of Israel. Paul's ministry here is a labor of love towards God. Before a watching world, at great cost to himself, of bringing Gentiles to the God of Israel, set apart and made acceptable to God by means of the good news of Israel's Messiah. And Paul considers this lifelong task this lifelong labor, the hardship, the agony, the suffering that would come with it as an undeserved gift from God. He says in 1 Corinthians 3, according to the grace of God which is given me. Galatians 2.9, he recognized the grace that had been given to him. In Ephesians 3.2, you heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to Paul on your behalf. Ephesians 3, Paul was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. To Paul, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Messiah. And again, in Romans 1, 5, Paul received grace for the apostleship to bring about the obedience of the Gentiles. All the way through Paul's ministry, what did Paul see? This was undeserved kindness from the Lord. It was God's grace to him, an undeserved blessing to labor and to suffer for outsiders who had never heard to come to know Christ. A second characteristic in this passage of Paul's ministry to the Gentiles was that it was accompanied by supernatural power, accompanied by supernatural power. Look down at verse 17. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, he says, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit. Paul here is boasting. Paul is boasting. And he's not boasting in himself. He's not boasting in his own accomplishments. He says he is boasting in Christ Jesus. If anyone boasts, let him boast in the Lord. He is boasting here, he says, in things pertaining to God. Not self, not his accomplishments, not his endowments, but the things that God did. His ministry was a grace gift from God, and Paul now gives glory to God for the outworking of it. Natural gifts cannot bring about the conversion of souls. There was nothing that Paul possessed personality-wise or gifting-wise or education-wise that could bring about the supernatural work that had to be done if any Gentile was ever going to believe in Messiah. 
If any human being is going to be raised from the dead by new birth in faith in Jesus Christ, it would not come about by human means. It would not come about by natural gifting, and it could not come about by human strategies. In the first great awakening in America, men like Edwards and Whitfield preached the gospel, and they saw remarkable work of God as Many people throughout entire villages and cities and regions believed the gospel. It truly was a great awakening and was something that people in successive generations longed for, longed even to see repeated. And there was, of course, in American history, a second great awakening. It was not quite like the first The Second Great Awakening was a mixed bag of mixed results. There were many genuine conversions. But there were also those who sought to bring about the results of the First Great Awakening by human means, human innovation, human strategies. They used mixed methods, not just the bold, unadulterated preaching of the gospel, but hooks and gimmicks and tricks what Charles Finney coined new measures. And these new measures were sought to bring about a mental assent to the facts of the gospel, an emotional response to an appeal of the gospel. Charles Finney employed such strategies as the anxious bench. The anxious bench was a a bench placed right up by the pulpit, and he would turn from the audience and call one person up to sit at the bench and preach hell, fire, and brimstone at the person until they relented and professed Christ. Maybe we should try that. (laughs) And, And people under the social pressures and the emotional hype would make a profession of faith. And at the end of Charles Finney's life, whose own supposed conversion was perhaps spurious, He gave this testimony of his own ministry. I believe it was my lot in life to bring about tens of thousands of spurious conversions. What a tragedy. People who named the name of Christ in a revival, in a tent meeting, in an excitable moment, but were no true disciples of Christ and fell away when life got hard. And the result of the Second Great Awakening in upstate New York and throughout the Midwest of the United States was known as the Burned Over District. People who had heard the gospel under these new measures, been there, done that, didn't work for us, and the town went dry. And from that point on, people were actually inoculated to the true gospel. A tragic series of events in American history. And demonstrates the reality of the poverty of human innovation to bring about what is absolutely required for a supernatural work. New birth. What Paul boasts here in verse 17 and following is the work of Jesus Christ. The work of God in his ministry. Not any human means, not any natural endowments, but supernatural power. And we see that supernatural power God used through the Apostle Paul to bring about far-reaching Gentile inclusion in God's redemptive plan. Look at verse 18. I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles. The obedience of the Gentiles here, as in Romans 1.5 and 16.26, is gospel surrender. That is, the obedience of the call of the gospel, entrusting oneself entirely to Christ. It, of course, results in a life of obedience to Christ, but itself is a repentance that obeys the gospel call, and Gentiles in droves repented and believed. This was the result of Christ's work through Paul. Gentiles surrendered to Jesus the Messiah. In verses 18 and 19, we see the means of Christ's work through Paul. First of all, the last little phrase of verse 18, by word and deed. These are Paul's words and Paul's deeds. 
He says also by power of signs and wonders and by the power of the Spirit of God. All of these means are supernatural power on display. God's power through the Apostle Paul in word and deed, in signs and wonders, and the power of the Spirit of God. Consider Paul's words and his deeds in the proclamation of the gospel to the Gentile world. From powerful public addresses, before riotous mobs and religious hypocrites and unjust rulers, to writing letters from prison, to teaching in the synagogues, in the marketplaces, and down by the river, laboring night and day, admonishing each one with tears, moving house to house, encouraging and teaching and admonishing, planting churches and strengthening church leaders. Paul gives testimony in Galatians 2.20 that it was not he who was living his apostolic Christian life, but Christ in him. His words and his deeds were the power of Christ in him. And the second means he lists here is the power of signs and wonders. Signs and wonders are two words that go together in a number of key places in Scripture. In fact, there are four locations that signs and wonders are coupled together in God's redemptive purpose. In the time of Moses, the Moses or the Exodus narrative in Deuteronomy and in Exodus, and then rehearsed for us in Nehemiah and the Psalms, uses this phrase signs and wonders to describe what God did in revealing himself to his people and rescuing them from slavery. A sign is a pointer. It points to something. It indicates something. And the signs and wonders were miraculous things that God did through His servants to point to the reality that those servants spoke for Him, that they were accurately representing His cause and His plan and His purpose. And in Moses' life, this was critical. It was critical that Moses' words be vindicated by these signs and wonders as testimonies and pointers to the God of Israel keeping His promises. These signs and wonders are seen in the ministry of Jesus. Acts 2.22 records, Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through Him in your midst. One of the reasons for Jesus' miraculous work was to demonstrate that He truly was God in the flesh. To speak out of nothing, fish and bread. To raise the dead, to cause the lame to walk and the blind to see. These things pointed to the fact that Jesus was, in fact, the creator himself in human flesh. Doing things only God could bring about. And then the apostles were given signs and wonders. They were given signs and wonders to attest to the truth that they bore Jesus' message, that they had been with Jesus, that by doing some of the same things that Jesus himself did, they gave testimony to the fact that their words were accurate. They were God's words. And if you think about it, a time where the New Testament was not yet written, these signs and wonders became critical signposts, markers to the validity of of their new and incredible message. Acts 2.43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Acts 4.30, you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servants. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among all the people, Acts 5.12. Stephen in Acts 6, 8, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. In Acts 14, they spent a long time speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who is testifying to the word of His grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by the apostles' hands. In Acts 15, all kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul, and they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. These signs and wonders were critical for giving credibility 
to the apostles' testimony about Christ. In fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. In other words, in order to have been an apostle, not only did you have to see the resurrected Christ personally, but you had to have the testimony of having performed signs and wonders. The author of Hebrews, looking back probably from a time when the signs and wonders had died out towards the end of the apostolic age, he looks backwards and says this, God was testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His will. These things were essential at the foundation level of the church. There is, of course, one more era of history that the Bible records will be marked by signs and wonders. And that is when the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, performs signs and wonders. Counterfeit ones, bad ones, but probably supernatural, demonically empowered, satanically empowered wonders. Jesus says, even if it were possible to lead away the elect, uh, there is a day coming when the world will be convinced of these miraculous powers at the hands of the Antichrist. But Paul identifies that in Christ, by Christ's power, signs and wonders were means by which Paul fulfilled his apostolic ministry. It was accompanied with this supernatural power. The point of signs and wonders was to confirm that those speaking about Jesus were actually faithfully representing the truth. And this was true in Paul's ministry, even though he was the last and the least of the apostles. And finally, he says, by means of the power of the Spirit. That is, in everything that Paul was doing as apostle, it was the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that was bringing about the conversion of the Gentiles. There's a third characteristic of Paul's apostolic ministry on display here. It's in verse 19. He says that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Illyricum is on the northeast coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. It's modern day Albania, Croatia, Montenegro. And if you go counterclockwise around the Mediterranean Sea from Jerusalem, uh, you get almost to Italy uh, when you approach this region called Illyricum. And if you think about the regions Paul would have gone to in these areas, we see these recorded throughout the New Testament. First, Paul did preach the gospel in Jerusalem. It did not go particularly well. But then from there, he preached in Syria. Uh, in Damascus and at Antioch, which became a hub of missionary enterprise. And then he went to the region of Cilicia and the town of Tarsus, where he was originally from, and then the regions of Pamphylia and Perga and Italia. He went to Pisidia and a second city called Antioch. Then he was in the region of Lyconia and then the region of Galatia. And then he went to the provincial province of Asia and the city of Ephesus, where he spent significant time. And then the region of Troas, and then the region of Macedonia with the cities of Philippi, Berea, and Thessalonica. And then he went to Achaia, where Corinth has its place. And then finally, you get to Illyricum in this counterclockwise movement around the Mediterranean Sea. We get just a, a sampling of the geographical regions Paul covered in his travels from Jerusalem roundabout to Illyricum. Consider the amount of walking required in the first century for these travels. And the hardships and the dangers that go with all of that. If you read through the book of Acts, you have to take on a, a, a bit of seamanship and learn a bunch of first century sailors' vocabulary. He went by sailing vessel and on foot from place to place to place. And there weren't straight lines. These were circuitous routes in all of these places and some back and forth. A year before Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, he wrote 2 Corinthians so one year before this letter, he records these things. 2 Corinthians 11, he talks about the things he endured. Labors, imprisonments, plural, beaten times without number, uh, 
couldn't remember how many times he got beat up for the gospel. Often in danger of death. Five times he received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. He was left for dead. They, they threw rocks at him till they were assured that he was no longer alive. He came to his senses and went back into town and continued his ministry. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, in dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers amongst false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from these external things, he says, There is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? And who is led into sin without my intense concern? Paul felt corporately and on an individual level the heart of a shepherd caring for sheep. He goes on and says, In Damascus, the ethnarch under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall, and so escaped his hands. Any one of those events that Paul records in 2 Corinthians 11, we would write a whole book about. And over and over and over again, we see the labor and hardship and struggle and trial that Paul endured to see this task done. He says at the end of his life in 2 Timothy 4, I am spent... I am poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. Why did Paul do all of this? We get a window into his life in 2 Timothy 2.10. He says, for this reason, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, so that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. Paul could have sat on his Calvinistic haunches, trusted that the Lord would do whatever he was going to do to bring people to himself, and Paul knew he was specially commissioned by Jesus to take the gospel to the nations. And he did not rest, he did not relax, and he did not retire. He endured all things for the sake of the elect, knowing that God uses means to bring about their salvation and with it eternal life. And so he says here, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Literally, he says, I have fulfilled the gospel. That does not mean that every individual was saved, or even that every individual in these regions was evangelized. But for Paul, what it did mean is that the regions were covered by strategic church planting. One commentator says it this way, Paul's point is that he has finished planting churches where Christ has not been named in the area extending all the way from Jerusalem to Illyricum. That is, Paul's foundation work was done in those regions. And so he was ready to move on. He didn't say the foundation work is done, now let's watch it get built. But he moved on to plow new ground, to look for virgin territory, to build new foundations. Now, this is interesting that Paul did not sit back here. He says, I'm done there. I fulfilled the gospel there, and I'm going to keep going. In fact, in verse 23 of this chapter, he says, there is no more place for me in these regions. I've got to get to new regions In fact, this was his purpose in visiting Rome in part, not just to establish them in the gospel, but to get encouragement from them on his way beyond Rome. He's looking beyond Rome in his desire to get to Rome. And his purpose in writing the letter to the Romans was to prepare them for that. It is something of a missionary support letter. Help me get to Spain. And this leads us to the fourth characteristic of Paul's Apostolic ministry to the Gentiles. Paul was driven by pioneering impulse. Paul was driven by pioneering impulse. 
verses 20 and 21. Thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. Paul is saying, not only do I do all things for the sake of the elect, but I want to go find more elect. And the farther out you went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, the farther out you went, the less exposure there was to the synagogue and to the Old Testament having been read and to any knowledge whatsoever about Israel's Messiah, the world's Messiah. More difficult ground to plow, humanly speaking. Paul went out in the power of the Spirit to preach Christ where he was not already named. He quotes here Isaiah 52, 15. We talk about the servant song of Isaiah 53. There's a bad chapter break there. It really includes part of chapter 52, and this is part of that servant song. This is Israel's song and the proclamation of lament that nobody has listened to Israel's report about Messiah who would come and suffer in order to bring sinners to God. He would justify the many by bearing their reproach, taking their scourgings, by being crushed by his Father. Jesus the Messiah would come and bear the sin, the iniquities of the many, in order to bring them to God. That is the song of the servant. And there's a day coming when Israel will sing that as a lament and a rejoicing as they look back at the one whom the nation crucified and rejected when they look on him in faith one day. But the song also includes this remarkable promise from 52.15, and Paul quotes it exactly here from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. They who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. Those who had never received a report about the Messiah, those who never had access to Isaiah, those who had never read Genesis 3.15, those who had never heard about the promise in Genesis 12 or 2 Samuel 7 or anything about the line of this one who had come and crushed the head of the snake and provide forgiveness of sin, people who had never heard the report, what would they do? They would see And those who had never heard, what will they do? They will understand. And Paul picks up this promise from the servant song, and he sees himself in part as fulfillment of that very promise, taking the gospel of Israel's Messiah to the Gentile nations. And truly, Paul is our apostle We are all in this room beneficiaries of his ministry and from those who took the baton from the Apostle Paul and handed that baton to others and to others and to others. So that from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, even to Tempe, almost as far as you can get from Jerusalem on the globe, we sing praises to Messiah. This is what God promised. Elsewhere in Isaiah, God said, I am Yahweh, I have called you in righteousness. Speaking to the servant who would come, I will hold you by the hand and watch over you. I will appoint you as a covenant to the people and a light to the nations to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. I am Yahweh, that is my name. In Isaiah 49, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This was God's plan through Messiah. Isaiah 44, 24, thus says Yahweh, your Redeemer, and the one who formed you from the womb, I, Yahweh, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself, spreading out the earth all alone. He says, it is I who made the earth and created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hands. I ordained their host. And the one who created the heavens, he established it. And he says, he alone is Yahweh. There's no one else. 
Israel's God was not a tribal deity for Israel alone, but the one true universal God over all the nations, and he promised to bring people from every nation and tribe and tongue and people to a knowledge of himself in his grace through Messiah. And Paul was rescued out of his xenophobic Phariseeism, elitist, legalist, self-assured, wretched state to be a rescued rescuer, an ambassador of Messiah to the nations around. Paul's ministry was unique. His commission, his gifts, his sufferings were unique. But the purpose that Christ would be named in places he has not yet known, that is a task that Paul had that is still yet the task of the church. It is the church's commission to make Christ known to all the nations. The church becomes the vehicle for the continuation of Paul's desire to plow new ground, to go where Christ has not yet been named. The church does not exist to be static. The church does not exist for it to be comfortable in its own place, to sort of arrive at its own individual maturity and keep a status quo. The apostles laid a foundation, and there are those who lay foundations in local assemblies of believers. Those individual local bodies of believers must grow and be mature in Christ. And faithful shepherds must stay and proclaim the truth and shepherd God's people to equip them for ministry. Every place that they are, every place that Paul went in his apostolic ministry and planted churches, he established qualified leadership in those places to stay and to grow and to become mature. But that's not the end of the story. Those churches must become disciple-making, disciple-making churches, training the next generation of pastors, 2 Timothy 2, 2, entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And successive generations must continue to do these very things. The church must multiply, training up new generations of disciples and pastors and missionaries. By the way, a healthy church is the best petri dish for the cultivation of future pastors and for missionaries. When missionaries go to places where the church does not exist... They ought to come from places where the church is healthy, where the church does exist, and they know what it is they are to reproduce. Local assemblies of believers in conformity to the New Testament standards. Local churches are the best petri dishes for the training of pastors for ministry in local churches. The church dare not surrender those training opportunities and responsibilities to other agencies less well-suited. Seasoned pastors giving wisdom and knowledge to pastors in training is a phenomenal way to continue this task, even the task that Paul himself did. Think about Training Leaders International and Wayman Lee's leadership in that. On many continents, nearly every continent, Wayman Lee has been traveling and teaching pastors to faithfully pastor in their context, in their local churches. Giving them the task to replicate that same model and that same mindset where they are. You think about places in our own time where the gospel has very little representation. Take Italy, for instance, and Massimo and Susanna and their family faithfully laboring there, slowly plodding one foot in front of the other, one gospel conversation after another, seeking to win people to Christ. We pray for them, we labor with them as they labor in difficult places. Think about places in our own neighborhood, closer to home, where the gospel is not faithfully represented. Where do churches need to be planted? Where do neighborhoods need to be intersected with people who love the gospel? Think about cities in our own nation that are 
desperately lacking gospel witness. There are those in our body contemplating planting a church in New Orleans. We pray and labor for places even further where the gospel has not yet ever been known. If you've been watching the news and the updates from our team in Papua New Guinea this week, this is an exciting week to be in Romans 15. To think about Paul taking the gospel where Christ had not yet been named. Just this week, we saw the culmination of a six-week-long gospel presentation. I don't know if you've ever taken the opportunity to preach the gospel two hours a day for six weeks to the same audience, getting to Christ in the sixth week and proclaiming the cross and substitutionary atonement and explaining the death and burial and resurrection of Christ to people who have never heard it. And of course, this six weeks culminates a decade of training and funding and praying and labor and multiple decades of waiting and millennia of peoples not having heard about Christ in this area. It was Thursday of this week, Wednesday for us, that Zach taught the death of Christ and explained how to be saved by believing in Jesus Christ's finished work in the village of Mairoro. It was Friday or our Thursday this week that Zach preached the resurrection of Christ, the empty tomb and victory over the death. It, it is Monday in Papua New Guinea. It is right this moment that Zach is preaching on the great commission and the ascension of Christ and his return to heaven. And it will be tomorrow, their Tuesday, that Zach teaches the final lesson on the return of Christ and the end of death and the end of all sorrow and the reverse of the curse. The team is rejoicing already at the mixed response to the death of Christ and the explanation of salvation. It was clear that this message was totally new for the Doe people. There has been some syncretism in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. There are buildings that are called Lutheran that have crosses and they celebrate 500 anniversaries of things. But they have not known Christ. They have not known substitutionary atonement. They have not known the way of salvation. They have not had God's word. It was clear that this was New. Some had been getting it as Zach has been teaching the last six weeks. As they've taught chronologically through the Old Testament from the creation and fall and flood and the Tower of Babel and the promises of God through a family in Genesis 12 on through the kings and the judges, the kings, the prophets, all through Old Testament history and the successive disappointments of no one has come in the seed line to crush the head of the snake. But finally, John the Baptist is here. He must, no, it's not him either. He said, it's not me. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Zach said to me this week that there are people who have been getting it from the sacrificial system that a substitute must die in the place of the sinner to make one right before a holy God and that someone's coming to be that sacrifice. And John the Baptist said it was him, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And they saw Jesus' perfect life. And they knew it had to be him. And when Jesus predicted his own death, his own resurrection, and the reason he came to lay down his life for sinners, Zach said there are some in the village who put two and two together and perhaps are already regenerate. There was a visitor from another Doe-speaking village who had walked in and intercepted Zach teaching Isaiah 53, leading up to Christ but not quite there yet. And he said to Zach, I, I, I've been around this church stuff and Christ stuff. I, I've never heard that, that the reason Jesus came was to die, to pay for my sins. Whoa, you have to come tell that to our village. And they immediately began strategizing with, well, when we get done teaching here, maybe if some of the people here in Maui Roro understand it, they can go to your village and help explain it. 
there were some who have responded negatively this week, effectively saying, there's no way that all the good things I've done up to this point are of no value. If you're saying the only way to get to heaven is to believe in Jesus and to renounce my so-called good works, and they said, I'm not having it. At least not yet. Others asked after the preaching of the cross, what must I do to be saved? And yet others have said, yes, Zach, this is the good news. Thank you so much for bringing this to us. One man stood and said, I'm a sinner. I must believe. And and that feature right there is remarkable and new in the village. Personal ownership of personal sins needing to be forgiven and seeing Christ as the only remedy. Zach and Amelia both told me this week that many people are just filled with joy. (laughs) And we will see what lasting fruit the Holy Spirit has produced. But these are long anticipated moments, long prayed for moments, years of training and fundraising and prayer. And and you remember when we first moved into this building, that back warehouse was filled with all those black and yellow boxes as we tried to just ship things to Papua New Guinea to get our people started. How long ago? (laughs) And to see God work. There are more tribes. There are more peoples with no gospel, no church, no Bible. Maybe you would go. Maybe you would set your life's course on doing what Paul said he wanted to do, not lay on another man's foundation, but go where Christ has not yet been named. Maybe you will stay on a solid foundation, and be equipped to take the gospel to your cul-de-sac, your community, your workplace. Maybe you're faithfully bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ into your home, making disciples the old-fashioned way. Maybe praying for them to go to the ends of the earth and say goodbye. I read an account this week of six St. Andrew's students trained by Thomas Chalmers in the 1820s and 1830s who went out from Scotland as missionaries to India. And they said goodbye to their families once and for all. Most never made it back. Maybe you would pray for your own kids to take up the baton that Paul handed off here. It is the reason we have the gospel here, is it not? And it is the reason the Doe people have heard the gospel this week. And we pray that the Lamb would receive the reward of His suffering. That people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people would hear. That the apostle of the Gentiles would see the fruit of His ministry fully fulfilled. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You. We thank You for our friends who have gone for Massimo and Susanna, for Wayman Lee and those who have gone with him and trained pastors and for those pastors on multiple continents faithfully proclaiming your word and preaching the gospel of Christ. We thank you for the Laymans and the Dodds and the Cans and the Mitchells and for Amelia and for another team seeking even now to move into another tribe and for other teams in training and preparation to go to the mountains of Papua New Guinea. We thank you for those who, with courage, went to the British Isles and to idolatrous cannibals, a warlike people who did not know you and preached the gospel there. We thank you for those who have gone from the British Isles all over the world. We thank you for the many who have gone from Latin America and South Korea to unreached places. And we know that there are still yet many unreached peoples, unreached languages on our own continent 
and in many other places around the world who need to know Christ. We pray, O oh God, that you would raise up more laborers with this desire. And God, would you equip us to be a church of gathered and sent ones each week, taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to everything that moves. We ask it in his name.